Okay, I'll, I'll start. This is a, it's a lunchtime event, and so I'll get down there before all the food goes. What I said I'd do today was, 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 as it were, revisit the sorts of things I have uh, been talking about the last seven lectures, but also then try and extend what I was talking about yesterday and the day before in terms of the relationship between the material and the immaterial as a site of what I call the plural event, to link that to what I want to call now the material event and try and develop that as a series of ideas. But let me sort of, you know, go back and try and indicate the sort of trajectory of, of, of these lectures. In the first instance, what I was always interested in was not a critique of representation, because there are representations, but to begin to understand the history of lines in terms of concepts such as potentiality. And I drew on uh, the move from the history of the line from its being you know, the shortest distance between two points to what we now call a spline. And it's that, as I was discussing with someone yesterday, dissolves the distinction between a straight line and a curved line in that they're just differing permutations of weightings given to the production of lines. So therefore, there's a need to recast the history of the line given that. In addition, the other fundamental element that played with the question of representation was the relationship between what, in terms of Freud's account of the unconscious, what is the distinction between the topographical account, which lends itself to a simple drawing, and the economic account of the, of the unconscious, in which were you to draw it, what the lines have to represent is on the one hand potentiality, on the other hand force. So the line drawn that indicates the barrier of repression is indicating an economic state of affairs that's not simply topological or topographical. And what that means, therefore, that in Freud's drawings, if you remember we looked at those, was a constant dilemma of whether you could represent something to do with movement and something to do with an economic and dynamic process, or whether you could represent that by the simple drawing of, of what, are, what are ostensibly static lines. I also remember, if you remember, went back and tried to look at how in Descartes' drawings there is a similar problem emerges. And so the, 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 the legacy of this notion of drawing leaves us with is the idea of being able to capture something static, but the difficulty of allowing that line to be seen as dynamic. And it's this expression of allowing to be seen that, if you like, then became fundamental. Because when you look at Freud's drawings, not only do you have to read them as a topological or topographic model, you equally have to see them as an economy. And it's how you then see them as an economy means that they're always more than their literal presence. And more than their literal presence actually means, as what I was trying to say yesterday and the day before, that they have to be seen abstractly. In other words, they have to be seen as Id identifying a state of affairs, the full description of which necessitates moving on from that particular mode of drawing. Now, moving on from that particular mode of drawing allows us to, to then make a connection between that conception of the line as abstract and what Deleuze was indicating by the diagram, which is not to say that Freud was a Deleuzean far from it. It's really that what the dr Freud's drawings cause us to have to think is that these lines do not represent something. They are the enactment of a dynamic process. But if they are the enactment of a dynamic process, moving on from that enactment necessitates seeing them not representationally but in terms of having a potentiality. And therefore, they have to be seen in the way I've tried to develop the term as abstract. Now, that then, if you like, was the challenge presented to us by Freud's drawings. And I think we can now see retrospectively why it is that those drawings, I think you each have a, an example, I think I handed them out, uh, have to be seen as abstract and then diagrammatic in the sense in which I've tried to develop the term over the last two or three lectures. Moving on from Freud, and I hope this order is correct, I then talked about Benjamin's text, Walter Benjamin's text on uh, drawing uh, and the drawing of lines to indicate at least, at least two things, possibly three. One, that what was very interesting about his understanding of the line within painting or the mark within painting 
was that it had to be understood in, as opening up a world defined by interiority. In other words, it didn't stand for anything external. It created a field of activity defined as an interior set of relations. And once it's defined in terms of interiority, then while it may be a painting of a flower, the best way of understanding it, as I've always said, is as a flower in paint. So you don't look for the flower of which it is the painting. It is the relationship of materials, the combination of which is a flower. And that therefore, it's, while, it's while it is a flower, it doesn't represent a flower, it presents a flower. And it presents a flower how? It presents a flower through the operation of its material elements. And therefore, a so-called materialist account and remember, fundamental to all of this was this notion of materialism. A materialist account of the flower didn't have to do with its symbolic or iconic value, but it had to be the way in which the materials worked together in order to generate that which had symbolic and iconic value. Therefore, the materialist account of the painting, or the, and here I'm using Zemper's notion of materialism, a materialist account of the painting or of, the, or of architecture has to be with the way in which the materials operate such as the after effect is something that has meaning. Now, the second element in Benjamin's account of, 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 of the mark in painting, or painting in general, is the way in which he talks about painting in the end in terms of composition. And composition is those elements, the coherence of which is the painting, and yet what coheres cannot be reduced simply to the elements. There's always something more. And that, that non-reduction to its elements calls on something specific, if you remember. Benjamin says that it invites being named. It's wonderful, it has the right to be named. And what he meant by, or what I'm taking him to mean by the right to be named, is you name that painting firstly as painting, but then in naming it, you explain how it is a painting, not that it is a painting. And in explaining how it is a painting, or how something is architecture, what you're looking at is the way in which interiority operates at a given moment, such that the after effect is that painting or that piece of architecture. So the value then of Benjamin's account of lines and of drawing and of painting was not only did it open up interiority, it gave us the idea of naming as the attribution to the object of identity. So even though we had to take you know, one step to painting in order to come back to architecture, Benjamin's early 1917 text provided a very valuable way of, of thinking about that as a state of affairs. I then moved on to talk about Melievich and Deleuze, and which I talked obviously about yesterday. Uh, the, the, to me, the important part, again, is linked to this question that I made a lot of yesterday, and that's of the question of the zero. If you remember that, that, that the challenge presented by uh, for example, Freud's drawings, was to see them as abstract, namely to see them as something that was generative of a description. Namely, they didn't represent anything. What they did was present something. But the something that they presented exists after the initial drawing. That allows us to think of that a drawing as a zero, in Malievich's sense, as the zero point. Now, the value of the zero point, as I said yesterday and the day before, is that what becomes interesting is the move to one. And the move to one has to be the release of the potential within the drawing, not of the, rent, not of the building of what's there on the screen. Now, Malievich's zero, I connected to Deleuze's notion of the diagram through the idea that the diagram is linked to piloting. <coughs> In other words, the, 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 for the Deleuze, the diagram is linked, as I said yesterday, to the notion of the yet to come. And the yet to come is obviously futural, but what it does is it makes the, makes the present the locus for the future. So futurity is a condition of the present. Therefore, the task in the present is, as it were, how to move from zero to one. Now, in order to understand that, what I, what I tried to argue was the way we think about that is by thinking very precisely about the role of what I identified as the machine, practice, and ontology in architecture. In other words, there's no use talking about the move from zero to one as though that were simply just 
an act of the imagination, a sort of creative leap in which one moved from zero to one. Moving from zero to one is an activity, it's a practice. And what it means that if it's a practice, it necessitates how within the realm of architectural theory, one begins to understand what it is that practice is. And therefore one has to understand that practice always takes place in relation to the tools that make it possible. And if it takes place in relation to the tools that make it possible, I then, as I argued, what you need is a theory of the machine. You need a theory of drawing instruments. You need not just the recognition that there is technological or digital reproducibility, you have to conceive of that object theoretically. And what I tried to do in one of the lectures was develop a notion of practice, machine and ontology that brought all these things together. And what it ended up with the argument, and this is just the last point of recapitulation, was that I tried to argue that the diagram in architecture has to be thought of in this terms of a materialist account of the relationship between the matter of hardware and the immateriality of software. And while those are always already interarticulated, what's articulated are two things that are distinct, the material and the immaterial. And their articulation, the bringing together of two distinct things, means that this is what I was then calling a plural event, namely a site of original ontological complexity between the material and the immaterial. But that's the condition in which the diagram and architecture gets to be acted out. If you go back to Borromini, the same argument will work, but now the material and the immaterial are reconfigured, and it's not that at all, but it's the relationship between the compass and whatever it was that uh, w w w the project was at hand. In other words, to we move <coughs> from the compass to the computer. What the computer brings with it is an additional element, which is software. The compass does not have software, therefore, it, the way it functions as a tool is due to its own firmness, its own solidity as a tool. The way in which a computer works as a tool is unthinkable except in relation to the immaterial, which is software. So while it sounds rather nerdy to go on about software, what's interesting about it is that it causes us to reconfigure, or to have to reconfigure, have to reconfigure the thinking proper to the tools of architecture's mode of reproducibility and therefore of creativity. So if we're thinking about the history of the tool or the history of drawing instruments, then we can't just write a linear history of drawing instruments. Drawing instruments have a disjunctive or discontinuous history, much like history in general. So basically, what I was th that's a very crude summation. <laughs> See, it didn't take two weeks, it took 20 minutes. That was a crude summation of the various things I tried to argue over the last two weeks uh, and tried to say that that the, the, the shift in our thinking or one's thinking that enables that to be possible is what happens in the age of digital reproducibility causes us to go back and rewrite the history of the line. Okay, now what I want to do now, in, I also want to leave some time for questions if people want, is to try and take this a, a stage further. And this, this, you know, heralds or presages, whatever word you want, you know, a, a future a, a project. I want to talk about architecture, I want to build on this material to talk about architecture as a material event. And I want to use this term material event to begin to incorporate not just the sorts of arguments I'm making about the digital, but about other forms of architecture and to try and just sketch how these things relate. What I take a digital event to be is a relationship between geometry, materials and programs. Let me give you an example of this that has nothing to do with the digital. Nothing at all to do with the digital. In uh, Bernard Schumi's project for the new museum in Athens, which will house the um, Parthenon marbles, as we Greeks like to call them, uh, when they get returned, or not, as the case may be, glass is deployed in a very specific way. It's deployed at le least two ways. When you walk into the museum, the floor is made of glass. It's reinforced, but it's made of glass. And underneath the floor, there, this glass floor, is an archaeological site, and it's an archaeological site on which there will be people working. 
So as you enter into the museum, you look through the glass, obviously it's reinforced glass, and you see archaeology as a lived experience. Equally, the way in which the, if you can imagine the Parthenon up here and the angles of the Parthenon, the museum captures exactly the same setting. And when you look from the, 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 this window up to the Parthenon, and you, you'll see exactly the, f the missing parts that are now will be now replaced here. So you look out through the glass, and it's not to do simply with vision, but you see the Parthenon whose marbles are there when you swing around. So glass has a, f has a very specific operation in this uh, building. It's not to do with transparency, though it is. It's to do with how Shumi, and, and rightly or wrongly, understands program. He understands program as realized through the operation of materials. So the idea that the archaeological heritage of Greece is still active, still part of what's going on, it's not dead and past, but it's part of that, is captured by the glass that you look through as you walk into the building. Equally, the attempt to engage with the question of the Parthenon marbles and what happened to them, etc., etc., is brought about not through tickets and, and, and slogans that underpin it, but by the transparency of the glass. So glass's transparency doesn't have to do with light, though it does. It has to do with the operation of program. So Bernard Chumi is an architect in general, you know, one can argue, of the many things the architecture is. One is materials are deployed programmatically. So it's not as though you have a space and then program it. The materials are fundamental to the way in which program is understood. So therefore, in his ar architecture, Questions to do with geometry are not of central interest to him because he's not em enormously interested in form creation. What he's interested in is materials and program. So if we're going to account for Shumi's architecture in terms of what I'm calling a material event, then this is one configuration of the relationship between materials and program. Now, what's interesting then is that if one takes program in this sense seriously, it is, it is that which is linked to a generalizable conception of function. In other words, it's accountable for, as, as it were, as external to architecture's configuration as a, as a locus of research, in the way I've used the term before, but becomes simply the attribution of something that's best realized through the operation of glass. Now, there are many, many other examples that one could give of how it is this notion of a material event can be recalibrated to account for differing architectural configurations. Now, what interests me, however, is how one begins to link the notion of a material event to the idea of the digital, or the idea of architecture in the age of digital reproducibility. Because there's still geometry, there are still materials, there is still program, but now we have differing ways of thinking about the operation of all of these three. Now, in order to give this some sort of setting, and this will take the five minutes to set up, but it's, it's very important to make a sort of a very minor historical argument here. It's minor in that it won't take long. It's major because of its consequences. The minor argument is this, is that what characterizes the appearance of modern architecture is the problem of its appearance. Namely, there is no one style proper to modern architecture. That's the heritage bequeathed to us by the German style debates in the 19th century. So there is no style proper. But what emerges with those style debates is the centrality on the one hand of, of ideas, but more importantly, the centrality of materials. And at a certain moment in the 19th century, a number of German architects said, we must be like the Greeks, not because our architecture should look like the Greeks, but because we should use materials properly. The Greeks used stone in marble and used its potential in every way conceivable. We should do the same with iron. We should use, then they're, they're arguing the end of the 19th century, we should use iron in the way the Greeks used marble and stone. It shouldn't look like it, that would be simply imitation, but it, there should be a linkage to materiality, and that's what becomes important. So it's the correct use of materials. But what becomes interesting then at this particular moment, is that materials are not thought to have 
their own implicit geometries. That what those are, so therefore material simply became matter through which something was created without realizing that material itself could be the site of investigation and research and in order to think about the construction of architect, architecture. I mean, the example that, that you know, I use every time, but I, I like it very much, is that the only thing that makes paper architecturally interesting is not that, but this, is that paper is a load-bearing structure, it's self-supporting structure, it stands up. But you can't make a building out of paper, but you can get volume from paper by doing that. So there's something intrinsic to the material of paper that allows us to think about a self-supporting structure. So investigation into, th into this is investigation into the material properties of paper. Now, what the 19th century German would have said is that, well, that's not very interesting because you can't build a building out of paper. True. But what you could do is take this as an analog model. Not an analog model thought representationally, but an analog model in relation to the properties of paper. And then say, because it's an analog model, how do I begin to think about the material properties of paper? What other materials are they best unleashed within? How do we think about this? Now, flip it round. Kiesler's very important investigations of the, end, in the Endless House Project which are fundamental in overcoming the tyranny of the corner, fundamental in rethinking the relationship between wall and floor. What Kiesler was not interested in was anything to do with materials. So in relation to what I'm calling a material event, he was interested in geometries, he was interested in program, but he had no idea how to realize it materially. So he sprays cement onto chicken wire or something like this, or plaster onto chicken wire, then has to have little clumps underneath holding the whole thing up. He had no idea how to create a notion of a single surface, not a double surface, but a single surface that was continuous whilst also being load-bearing and all self-supporting. So he, he didn't investigate the material problem of the column, for example. He didn't ever think through materiality in terms of that which was has to be connected to geometry and program. So the critique of Kiesler is not that the thing doesn't work, it's too easy. As a piece of research, it's perfect on the level of geometry and program. What it doesn't do is think about materials. Now, in order to make Kiesler work, what do we do? We don't just you know, think of it and just put it to one side. We take the endless house thing as a diagram. In other words, we take it as a condition of zero. But because it's already, in other words, we take it as an analog, as an analog model, not a digital model. And because it's an analog model and a diagrammatically, a diagram and an analog model, we have to, in taking it as zero, ask what the move to one is. And the move to one will always be, well, I like to think, though I could be wrong about this, will always be disjunctive in relation to zero. So in order to take uh, the analog model as zero, the way in which you move it to one is through its becoming digitized. In other words, it's that disjunctive relation between the analog model and the digital model, between zero and one in Malievich's terms, that will allow whatever potentiality there is in the Endless House project, for example, to be realized. In other words, you don't think about things, well, how could we really build this? It's only by moving it on, by viewing it diagrammatically, does it become possible then to make claims about it as architecture understood in the terms of a material event. At the moment, Kiesler's project, even though solid, hard, in museums, this big, etc., etc., has to work diagrammatically in order for it to work architecturally. Otherwise, it just is illustrative. And what it illustrates is a failed project, a project that couldn't be built. But if we want to move from the illustrative to the productive, Remember one of the lectures I talked about the distinction between an illustrative image and a productive or generative image. If we want to see Kiesler's Endless House Project as a generative image, then we have to see it at the condition of zero. In the same way as when I showed you the Malievich, you know, lo what looked like houses, looked like buildings, even with little people on them to give you scale. When we looked at those and we had to take seriously Malievich's insistence that they be seen as objectless, the only really interesting question was how they became, became object. But objectless 
which is in Russian the same word as abstract, the objectless, in order to become object, has to move from, from zero to one. And therefore, it's moving from the diagram to something else. So what becomes interesting then is to think about the notion of the diagrammatic outside of simply images. In other words, it's how does one bring in materials as a site of investigation and research in architecture? How does one begin to operate on materiality? Well, one of the obvious ways is to, to, to think about you know, the crumpled piece of paper as an illustration at the moment of what it means for a building to be, or an object to be, uh, self-sustaining, self self-supporting, self that holds itself up. Now, in order to make that an architectural project, one has to ask, and there may not be an answer to this question, what is the move on from here? Now, in terms of real geometries and real investigations with materials, it was Fry Otto who moves from here to the next stage, who takes not these as, as models or illustrations, though Fry Otto does tend in that direction, and then becomes Calatrava. What you then do is you see this not as a very small version of something that will be large, but to work out what, if this is an analog model, of what is it a model? And how would I get to the next stage of modeling? And you could, if you like, and I'm not going to do this, begin to develop a critical engagement with both Fry Otto and Calatrava in that they literalize their models. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what they do is they take them as smaller versions of something that becomes large scale. In other words, they, they fail to take these as analog models, but they take them as always already representational, where representational is thought in terms of scale. So they become smaller instances of something that can become larger. So what's interesting then, if one doesn't want to think about models in terms of scale, and therefore in terms of representation, but models as actually having intrinsic material possibilities, the question then is how do those possibilities get to be released? The way in which you think about the release of any possibility is to recognize that potentiality always has to be disjunctive in relation to the realization of that potential. I mean, even the sort of like philosophy 101 version of potentiality that says in the block of marble is the, scu is the sculpture. And so, you know, you sculpt away and out comes the sculpture. Even, and, and obviously that's nonsense, even that view still ends up on the level of the image with a disjunctive relation between the sculpture and the original block of marble. So it always releasing potential is about the creation of something that has a disjunctive relation to the point of departure. So therefore, if we're thinking about uh, geometries, we can think about them as inextricably bound up with questions of matter, even if matter doesn't figure uh, in relation to the geometry, or you can have matter that's not uninterested in geometry. In Shumi's work, geometry doesn't is, no, is of no interest. So form creation on that level is not of interest, materials and program are. But if you flip it round, what becomes interesting, then we operate always internally. What becomes interesting is the way in which these analogue models only realise their truth digitised. And then you further examine them by building another analogue model, then you move to the digital. And it's always these series of, of disjunctive relations that open up spaces of investigation and research. So in terms of the material event, therefore, materials exist in a, different, in a range of different ways. On the one hand, it's glass, and therefore gives you a notion of program in Shumi's case. Or it's materials functioning not in terms of their, their literal presence, but in terms of the way in which they generate sites of research and that means looking at the inherent geometries and properties of materials to allow them to operate. The example I used uh, in the lectures, because I've just been writing about it, so I do use it, is um, uh, Eisenman's Naples Railway Station, which was not built, but what is interesting about the Naples Railway Station is that if we're going to investigate materials, what becomes interesting is those materials have to accord with what is possible with spline-based geometries, Spline-based geometries are only realizable if they have a relationship to materials so that splines become space frames, etc., etc., etc. So in other words, that there becomes a site in which what we're looking at is a much tighter relation between materials and geometries in order that the project be realizable.
while in other cases, questions to do with geometries and materials may be simply a non-question. So materials, and finally, therefore, and I've yet to come to geometries and program, but I will, materials, therefore, have to function in a number of different ways. The question is, how does one allow material to function as a degree zero? Rather than representing something, for it to be a site of investigation means that the material has to function the way that Malievich's drawing did as a zero condition. Now, there can be no generalizable answer into how that potentiality is realized. I tried to argue yesterday uh, that what becomes important about the notion of potentiality is that it has to be thought outside a structure of teleology, something leading inexorably to a given point, but equally outside the structure of final form, which would be the enactment of, if you like, the teleological. So therefore, where the research on this goes, how do we know? But what we're, we know what we're researching. In other words, we're, we're researching an analog model, and therefore the question is given a certain analog model, how is its truth understood? And that then becomes interesting in writing the history of models. Most models are created in order to be representations, are ordered to be images of something that will come. And it's very interesting now that in it's worth going to Vienna in general. It's worth going in this instance because of this Eisenman exhibition. Because what, it, what he shows there are no longer do you have pictures of buildings. No longer do you have images of buildings at all. What you have are sort of bits of the space frame. Or you have a, the, the wooden slats that made up one of the early houses. Or you have, in other words, you have bits of material. In other words, you don't even have models, though there are one or two models. But what he wants, what he's doing, and I think it's very interesting, and there's a, a very interesting Japanese architect called, uh, the company's called uh, Atelier Hitoshi Abe, and one, he has an exhibition at the moment in Senjai, and his exhibition is of elements from his buildings. He has a little museum, which only has a very small number of rooms, because it's a very small number of art arts. And what holds the museum up also generates the walls and generates the walls, generates the spaces in which the display is displayed. So when he has the exhibition of his work, what he displays as his work is not a picture of the museum, but the way, but an element of this wall situation, which indicates, because that's what he takes his architecture to be, namely a material instance of something in which the operation of that wall, the way in which the building is, is, holds itself up, the way in which program is realized, that's given to you by the way in which this wall is created. Now, whether that's right or wrong doesn't matter. What becomes interesting, and this is a project, is the recognition that here is something to do with the display of architecture that takes architecture to be linked to its literal material presence and not that of given to you by a model. So if we're going to write the history of the model, which is well worth doing, because there have been models for a very long time, if we were to write the history of the model, we'd have to show how that history is, is inextricably bound up with the notion of what architecture is taken to be, where that is thought as necessarily linked to its capacity to represent, to be represented. In other words, the model functions within a certain understanding of architecture's relation to representation. Once that relationship becomes to be reconfigured, what counts as a display of architecture becomes far more complicated. Because what you're seeing then in that display is that complication, or what is made possible by that complication. So when we just go back to lots of little balsa wood models, our critique of that is that it's, it's inappropriate to know what's possible within architecture understood as a material event. Why would balsa wood, or whatever it is, tell us something about its operation of architecture as architecture outside of just an image? Like, here's a building. It could be a photograph. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And at certain points, this will be needed to document what a building may look like afterwards. It may be needed to have a small-scale version of it. I'm not disputing that at all. But because there is another possibility of presenting architecture, because architecture now has a different relationship to materiality, and materiality now has a different relationship to a range of geometries, simply showing a picture or simply showing a balsa wood model is already a commitment but one can develop a critical engagement with it precisely in virtue of what's possible now. And that, that goes back to, if you like, the ends of teleology, the overcoming of final form, 
because these things are now much more negotiable than they ever were, the U reduction of architecture to the image, to the photograph or the Balsawood model is contestable. And that contestation has to do with how we think about modeling and representation in the age of digital reproduction, which moves far beyond the digital, but also takes into consideration the possible move from analog models to digital models to the way in which the truth of an analog model may be only discovered digitally and not, and not on the level of the analog at all. In other words, the truth of the analog model has nothing to do with its being an image of something to come, but when scanned into some other program, you can begin to manipulate it and work with it. So it has nothing to do with it as a representation, but everything to do with its diagrammatic force, even though it's solid and not a line flickering on the screen. So uh, therefore, as I said, materials and geometries get to be importantly related. Now, I'll come back to that, but the final part of this notion of a material event uh, is the way in which program comes to be thought. I explained yesterday, or explained, I tried to indicate yesterday, how there are at least two ways in which we could understand program. We can understand program in the sort of Bernard Schumi sort of way that it's simply, I'm not interested in form creation, I'm interested in this which programmatically operates in this way, it's done through the use of materials. In his uh, new museum in San Paolo, it's that he uses glass in again in a very interesting way. He takes up, I mean, you know, my favourite building in the world, which is Mendelssohn's 1926 Stuttgart um, shopping centre, and that corner which is glass, and so it's all about glass and circulation, and therefore people existing in the public realm. Jimmy takes that corner. I don't know whether he does this intentionally, but I like to think he does. He takes that corner and turns it into a building. And so what you then have is a building that is all about circulation, but you look at the art on the inside. Through the glass, you see San Paolo and the city, but on the, so it's the absolute opposite of the Guggenheim, the, the Frank Lloyd Wright, the, that, the one in um, New York, where you can't see art. It's as though he didn't trust the public. So it's a public building, but the public can't see in, you can't see out. So the art is on this wall here and you can't see in or out. So your notion of the public is, is a very private public. Now what Shuri does is reverse the situation. So the art is on the interior of the coil and the, the glass is on the exterior. So you see out and as you see out, you look at yourself, look at the public, you see yourself as part of the public realm, you look back in and you see the art. But you can't help but move between that your being as a public body and as an art viewing body. How does that all occur? Through the use of glass and transparency. But it's obviously it's transparency, but it's done for a very specific reason. And so it's very interesting. It has nothing to do with anything blobby or fractals or digital or nothing like that at all. It's simply to say that glass does the job vis-a-vis -vis how he understands the program. And therefore, and I actually do think, to me, to speaking personally, Shumi to me is the key modernist architect of, of the moment precisely because of his singular lack of interest, in, which he says quite happily, in form making, but his real interest in the use of materials to realize strictly programmatic concerns. But those programs, you know, for an old situationist, are always more complicated than predictable in that, that sort of sense. What becomes interesting then is to think about that's one way of un understanding program is realized through the operation of materials. And there's a lot more I hope next year to develop a whole series of lectures on that particular question. Now, flip it round. If we, how do we think of program in the era of digital reproducibility? Well, that's one option, but the other option is to make what I was talking about yesterday in terms of programmatic diagrams. In other words, that we can use notions of drawing and form creation in order to begin to sketch the complex relations that will occur <coughs> when we think of program. Let me give you a very straightforward example. One of the things that's often neglected is the relationship between the outside wall and the urban landscape. Architects tend to think that architecture begins with this wall and they design the inside as though the relationship between the outside and the world was not absolutely architectural except on a level of decoration. And that, that's fair enough, but that's, that's a limit. Now, so how would you begin to see that threshold condition or that moment of, the, of, of exterior, exterior wall and entrance, that sort of thing? How would you begin to represent that?
one clear way in, is to do a research project that has two differing but related modes. One is to see that logics of fenestration, of entrance and egress are all part of the logic that generates the wall. So there is no distinction between, in terms of form generation, between entrance, exit, uh, fenestration, all those sort of things. It's the same algorithm that generates the wall, differentiates at certain moments and something opens up and you get a thing called a door. That's one way to do it. The other way is to begin to drag lines of movement across a terrain such that a certain mode it deforms and what you get would be something like a wall. And in other words, that you take a surface and instead of seeing the building and the surface in terms of figure ground relations, you take the entire thing as the figure and allow the surface to individuate what at a certain moment would not just be the building but would be its exterior wall. And in that sense you can begin to see in what sense you, you would never just be uh, build, uh, designing on the level of figure ground relations, you'd be designing urbanistically, you'd be designing figure figure relations and that had to do with always taking the exterior wall as individuated by the, by the terrain itself and not just plonked on the terrain. So research about how the ground is made, research about the history of the ground, research about the whole area will at a certain moment allow for itself to deform a grid or to be calibrated in terms of weightings in some way. You can make a formal intervention understood as that's the moment of differentiation between the inside and the outside. Now, then how it got to be built or how it got to take actual formal presence would be a second question. What you're investigating in this instance is, is the distinction, distinct ways in which the ground itself can pick up and differentiate inside and outside conditions. And to that extent, you've already begin to begun to think programmatically as given to you by a terrain rather than by simply by uh, the imposition of a wall. And to that extent, as you feed more and more information into your program in order to do this, you're, beginning, you're allowing your program to pick up uh, a whole series of conditions that otherwise you'd only just be able to give on the level of an explanation. That would be one way. The other more abstract way which I talked about yesterday, and the example I used was again, uh, one I've mentioned here a number of times, was the museum, new museum in, in Egypt prior program, which was extraordinary. They divided Egyptian history up into seven periods and said within each period there's got to be five different things, culture, kingship, politics, food, whatever it was, that has to be investigated, has to be shown. Not only that, some kingdoms, some periods are more important than others. In each, some periods, questions of kingship and food are more important than in others, etc., etc. You have this incredibly complex program, but then they say you want to be able to get through this in an hour. In other words, all what you could take all day. There's got to be a path through the central parts of Egyptian history that all got to be done in an hour. So how do you do that? Well, the only way you could do that is by a very complex form of modelling in which you get you know, adjacencies, you get a whole series of things, but you need a way of, an, an, of representing lines A, B, C, D and E where the thickness of the line has to do with its importance. And within the thickness of the line, you can then begin to differentiate varying elements and you can then begin to bring these things into adjacencies and you end up with a series of tubes crossing and interconnecting. The crossing and interconnecting of tubes is the way of capturing the centrality of circulation, but equally of capturing the centrality of circulation allows for all of this program to be articulated together. And when the tubes cross and open in those areas, you can have infrastructure, whatever you want. So you have zones that aren't programmed because of the way in which you've done it. Now, you, and you see this, this wonderful meld of rhino sausages on the screen. And then you ask yourself, this looks like a building. Is that a building? And that's the question about the zero. If it's a building, then it's already one, and it's not zero. If it's zero, then it's a programmatic diagram. The question of it's being built becomes the question. And what it would mean for it to be built becomes the question. In other words, what you've done is you've used the, 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 the mechanisms of represent representation, of investigation, to allow you to continually recalibrate questions of complex program, to articulate circulation within it, but at no point do you say, I've moved from zero to one. And the question of moving from zero to one becomes the question of responsibility.
and to be ethical for a moment. Like, when is an architect responsible? When he or she moves from zero to one. Why are they responsible? Because that's a decision. Once you move outside of teleology or final form, there is no one that is given in advance from the zero. There may be for some architect, but there need not be. It's always negotiable. Therefore, the move from zero to one is a decision. And if you take something like this notion of material event or architecture in the age of digital reproducibility, the criteria of judgment is in how an architect moves from zero to one. Therefore, how they think the zero condition and how they think the condition of one. Obviously, I've been playing with these terms slightly, but what becomes interesting is how we can maintain uh, this as a site of developing what I called yesterday programmatic diagrams. But we tend to think that programmatic diagrams, because they appear volumetric and they look like buildings, are, as it were, always already buildings. And that is possible, but that means that you already have faced the zero condition once you've created a program. Now, therefore, the question is, uh, as I said yesterday, is, is how you move from zero to one is the uh, interesting question. And what I said yesterday, and I still believe it because it was only yesterday, was that the move from zero to one is the locus of architectural research. The very fact there isn't one answer means that the s how you move from zero to one is a domain of activity. Now, part of it may involve the move from analog, sorry, sorry, digital to analog to digital to analog modeling. So you're allowing then materials to form part of the site of research not materials that it gets to be built from this, but materials in terms of how you can then begin to think about relations may invest, necessitate Fry Otto-like you taking up material possibilities. As Lars Freibrook and others do, it's not just him, there are many now who look at the potentials within materials in order to investigate this disjunctive relation between the material, the analogical and the digital. That would be one way of, uh, of moving to zero. But the very fact that there isn't any one way means that we now have an activity called research. And that in, is what happens when we move away from the notion of strict determination to this indeterminate series of relationships. Now, I, I want to close in a minute, because I'll see if there are questions and there's lunch and all those sorts of things for you. But what becomes interesting to me is what makes this possible as a project? Is it simply, you know, my fevered imagination that allows me to sit here and go on and on about these topics? Or is it ground in something? Well, I called my first lecture from uh, splines to lines, trying to argue that it's really this moment in shifts in represent representability that causes, allows me to reconfigure all of these things, not because they lead up to this, they don't, but given this, I can now rework the history in order to make it what Foucault would have called a history of the present, rather than writing a history that leads up to the present. So it's not really history in that sense, but it's a reconfiguration of moments within the history of various disciplines, or the past of various disciplines, to give them actuality for our thinking. Now, the se this lecture was supposed to be called, indeed it is called, from... Um, what were they called? From, one was from splines. This is from lines to splines. In other words, it's, it's now that we know that, that there are resources in Descartes and Leibniz. We know there are resources in Fontenelle and Hegel, in Freud, in Benjamin, etc., etc. That the modernist tradition that we thought was past, and we weren't doing that anymore, Almanievich and Deleuze, that we thought that was all you know, in the past, it's actually as central now as it ever was but in its, with its radical reconfiguration. Namely, that, the, that there are various forms within the history of thought and the history of building that have struggled with the problem of the dynamic, that have struggled with the problem of the representation, that have struggled with the problem of how it is that there are differing systems at work. It's not as though we're in a more privileged position, but we're in a privileged position now to understand that the relationship between the static and the dynamic can have a form that it's never had before. Let me give you one example, a very dramatic example, to make this very clear. As always, I don't have an image, so if you don't know the sculpture, you have to rush and look at a book. It's a sculpture by Bernini, and it's of uh, Daphne being pursued by Apollo. Apollo yeah. And she's turning into a tree, the way you do if you're pursued by someone. And what's so wonderful is Bernini's wrestling with this transformative problem. 
of how do you make a smooth relation. It's very it's as though you know, he'd read some Deleuze and thought, how do I do this? How do I turn something that's one thing into another? He hadn't, and how do you make this possible? And this, the drama of this sculpture, and it's, and it's brilliant. I mean, Bernini, to my mind, is one of the great sculptors, not such a great architect, but a fantastic sculptor. And as her hands slowly begin, the twigs emerge out of the fingers, and all of a sudden you can see her becoming the tree. And then you look, one inch is a woman, other inch is the tree. And what Bernini is wrestling with is how, in one system, can I move from woman to tree? One of the big sculptural questions. And it's as though what he's wrestling with is, two th is, is at least two things. One is how can I stage this notion of transformation so that at the end points it's disjunctive, tree, woman. And yet the process is not you know, woman ends here, tree begins there, but it's a gradual process of movement. In other words, what he's dealing with is the problem of connectivity. He's dealing with the question of dynamic. He's dealing with the question of how a system, and this is the becoming tree out of woman, the becoming woman out of tree, thing, how you run it, how the system can individuate, tree at one end, woman at another, and this marvellous moment of indetermination in the middle. And that's the problem that we can now deal with. We now have the capacity to understand that that transformation is not just held in, in stone, but we can now use that generatively, i.e., when, when Bernini did it in 1630, whatever it was, all he could do, though it's hardly all, it's a staggering sculpture, it's in the Villa Borghese in Rome, all he could do was give you the instance of this moment. What we can do is turn Bernini's sculptor into a diagram. In other words, we don't see it as a woman turning into a tree. We see it as a system in which there's A and B and the process of movement between one and the other. Viewed as zero, it's not apart from, it's, it's not an element of Greek mythology, though it is. Viewed as zero, it's not a claim made about marble, though it is. Viewed at zero, it's not a representation, though it is. Viewed as zero, it's what happens at one given that sculpture. And as I said, if you take Piranesi's um, prisons as a point of departure, and instead of seeing that as a, the failure of those bridges to meet, to see it as zero is to say what happens at one. To take Bernini's sculpture of Daphne and, and Apollo and see that as zero is to ask well, how do we di what's that like as a diagram? What's interesting about Deleuze's work on the diagram is he then wants to say, look, the diagram is abstract, but it abstracts from. So it allows us to, and exactly the same as Malievich's point on the objectless. It was more or less the same argument. So the objectless becomes that which allows for something that is not even the condition of one. So the, the, the diagramming of Bernini allows us to move from it viewed as zero to a possible one that would then occur. And it would, might be very interesting to you know, scan Bernini in and then see what would happen were you to begin to manipulate this as an organizational system and not just as a sculpture. But we can do that. We have the capacity to do that. Now, two things emerge from that. One is that it then opens up the possibility of, uh, of using these things anyway. But what it does, I think, just to me, you know, being slightly old-fashioned, is that it gives Bernini another, go another chance. In other words, instead of being relegated to the history of sculpture, Bernini's sculpture of Daphne and Apollo suddenly becomes integral to our thinking. So it's not as though we can ever escape the 17th century or whatever it is. Now, there will be sculptures that are useless. I mean, mannerism as a cultural form is useless for this. But there are certain moments of Baroque sculpture, particularly Bernini's, and, uh, and Gian Bologna. Gian Bologna and Bernini, we need to go back, uh, back to look at this as process individuating as a, a process that individuates elements. And so we can now go back to Bernini and say, instead of say, it's part of the history of art, you know, Yabu sucks, how boring, it's actually exactly what we want in order to think. So we mine this and we write what I would call theoretical histories. We take elements that, that, that existed, reconfigure them because we now are in, a, in, a, in the position to reconfigure them. So it's not simply a fantasy I might have about Bernini. This fantasy about Bernini is possible
because of the shift in the nature of representation and therefore the nature of what is possible in the age of digital reproducibility. Okay, well that's, it's two o'clock, that's, sort of, that's what I wanted to get through today. I wanted to give you some sort of summation of what we did, what, I, what, I, what we all did, me going blah, 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 you very kindly listening, over the last eight lectures, in order to summarize it, but then to give you, I think, you know, the, the, the coup de grace, which is to talk about Bernini. Namely, to see in what sense that in the 21st century, it still becomes absolutely central to recognize that the question of process and individuation is, 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 has an afterlife. But it's a, not an afterlife made through speculation or being clever or being a connoisseur. It's nothing to do with that. But what, what, it, what releases the afterlife of works is a change in the structure of, of, of reproducibility. And for us, that change has to do with the digital and that yields our modernity. So that's the point at which I want to stop. If there are questions, please, please do ask them. That, that's as much what I wanted to get through. That's the summation. Thank you. There don't have to be questions, it's fine. <laughs>